Today, we're in Honolulu, where we will conduct the first islands-wide evangelistic crusade in the history of the Hawaiian Islands. We will hold major evangelistic crusades on each of the main islands. Hawaii is America's 50th state. There's a string of more than 20 beautiful tropical islands in the Pacific Ocean. The eight largest islands form our newest state. Thousands of tourists are here this time of year to enjoy the warm climate, the beautiful scenery, and the warm waters of the South Pacific. High volcanic peaks loom above the fields of sugarcane and pineapple. Thousands of sportsmen come here each winter to enjoy fishing, swimming, surfboarding, and boating in the sparkling waters along sandy beaches. The friendliness of the people gives Hawaii the nickname of the Aloha State. Aloha is the Hawaiian word for greeting. Hawaii produces almost one out of every eight cups of sugar used in the United States. Three-fourths of the world's pineapples come from Hawaiian plantations. Hawaii's central location makes it the crossroads of the Pacific. Most people think of Hawaii as a tourist attraction, but as a Honolulu pastor recently said, from a Christian point of view, it is a mission field. One of the largest religious groups in Hawaii is Buddhism. Only about 10% of the population even claims to be Protestant. Hawaii has fewer Christians per capita than any other American state, even though it was founded and settled by missionaries. Several years ago, the pastors of Hawaii invited us for an evangelistic crusade. After much prayer, we accepted the invitation for this month of February 1965. If a lasting spiritual impact is made on Hawaii, it will take prayer. We need your prayers during February that God will send a spiritual awakening to our youngest state. Thus, we're asking Christians throughout the world to join us in prayer, especially for the Honolulu Crusade that begins on February 14th in the beautiful new International Stadium. It was nearly 24 years ago on December the 7th, 1941, when planes of the Japanese Navy bombed the United States naval bases at Pearl Harbor, the air base at Hickman Field, and other military installations. Since that eventful day, the world has radically changed. Japan and Germany, who were our enemies then, are among the closest allies of the United States today. At that time, 24 years ago, Russia and China were allies and friends of the United States. Today, nearly $50 billion is being spent each year to keep up-to-date military power to defend ourselves against the possibility of attack from Russia and China. Last week, during the funeral of Winston Churchill, many newspapers recall the Atlantic Charter, issued by Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt 24 years ago, in which they called for four freedoms with which we're all familiar. Yet today, there is less freedom in the world than ever before. The world is still searching desperately for peace and freedom 24 years later. Dr. John B. Kenyon has listed six freedoms necessary to real peace for the individual, and thus the peace of the nation and the world. There is no possibility of world peace until the individual has found peace, because the world is made up of individuals. First, there is freedom from God's law. It is impossible to have peace without assurance of pardon. All men are born into the slavery of sin. That slavery is far more binding than anything that Red China could impose. It is useless to talk about peace unless we have an emancipation from this slavery. The Bible teaches that all men are born under a colossal debt. Even as babies in America are born into our national debt and each must share in it in the future, Every descendant of Adam is born under the debt of humanity and sin, which later progresses into personal sin. The only hope of your freedom, the only way you can be emancipated from the chains of this debt is through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He redeemed us from the slave markets of sin. But that freedom, that payment, and that pardon must be appropriated by the individual as you receive Jesus Christ as your own Savior. Therefore, there must come a point in your life when you accept and appropriate this freedom for yourself from sin and the broken law of God. The second essential freedom for peace is freedom from fear. There must be assurance of protection. We're engaged in building gigantic armaments to protect the American people. It gives us a certain sense of security and safety. And yet when we realize the overwhelming military power of communism, 
and hear reports of great new secret weapons that are being developed, we still have a sense of uneasiness and fear. This past week, both Indonesia and Egypt announced that they hope to explode atomic bombs this year. The Bible even commands sinners to be afraid. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, the Bible says. We have done evil. We have forgotten God. It is time that we fear God. If there is no fear of God in the hearts of people, then there is little hope indeed. Only Christ can say, fear not. And he said it not to the world, but to his own. Fear not, for I have overcome the world, he said. Only in Christ can we have freedom from fear. The United Nations in New York is filled with suspicions, with criticisms of each other and with fear. The shadow of a third world war hangs over the beautiful building on the bank of the East River in Manhattan. Prime Minister Harold Wilson this past week warned the world of the possibility of war. The only personality in the universe at this hour that can remove that fear is Christ, for he is the Prince of Peace. The third freedom that is necessary is the freedom from want. There must be the assurance of provision. That's a big order for a new president like President Johnson. All mankind is searching for ideal conditions in a world that is anything but ideal. Men seek an ideal effect without an adequate cause. Many people think the world owes them a living. If that is true, who's going to pay off this indebtedness? Everything that you receive free, somebody had to work to pay for it. I am convinced that a peace which is built upon promises of keeping the people free from want is precarious indeed. We can try, but it is an increasing impossibility to provide such a freedom for the peoples of the whole world. Populations are increasing at astounding rates. There are more hungry people today than ever before. There are more diseased people than ever before. Supply is not keeping up with the demand. Supplying the wants of an ever-increasing need is almost an impossible task. And yet the new president is going to be called upon not only to help supply the needs of the American people, but also the necessities and wants of the peoples of the world. I know of only one ruler who can supply our needs and our wants. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That promise is made to the people of God. He can supply our wants and give us perfect contentment. The scripture says he will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The Christian has a right to call upon the inexhaustible supply of God to meet his needs. Fourthly, we must have freedom from death. Unless we have this freedom, then everything else is in danger. Death cancels out every blessing. Nothing matters if death ends all. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And yet it is painfully obvious that no man or nation can give freedom from death. Every person listening to my voice has a death sentence hanging over him at this hour. How can governments expect to keep the world at peace when the peoples of the world are marching inevitably to certain doom? One of the basic desires of the soul is to live on and on. Self-preservation is the first law of nature. Men may grow tired of aches and pains and the decrepitude of old age, but they do not grow tired of life itself. God has arranged to satisfy this yearning of the soul to live forever and this desire to be free from pain and sickness and trouble. Man is a little creature with a big capacity, a finite being with infinite desires, deserving nothing but demanding all. God made man with this huge capacity and desire in order that he might come in and completely satisfy that desire. God made the human heart so big that only he can fill it. He made its demand so much that only he can supply that demand. The government cannot compete with God. The government has nothing satisfying to offer to the soul, and therefore it cannot bring peace to the soul. Jesus Christ is the only one who holds the keys of death. In his death and resurrection, he took the sting out of death. And now God offers eternal life to every person who puts their trust and faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Fifthly, there is freedom from isolation. The human soul is a lonely thing. It must have assurance of companionship. Left entirely to itself, it cannot enjoy anything. God said in the beginning, it is not good that man should dwell alone. The creation of Eve was the beginning of human companionship. 
God's people are a body not intended to function separately, not intended to be unconcerned for one another. The only true body in the world is the church. The world may talk grandly of brotherhood, but in reality its philosophy is each man for himself. What the government cannot supply, God freely gives. His children are guaranteed the richest and truest friendship both here and hereafter. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, in that ye love one another, said Jesus. Only in a true friendship and a true love do we find a genuine basis for peace. And only God can break down the national and racial barriers that divide men today. Only God can supply that love that we must have for our fellow man. We will never build brotherhood of man upon earth until we are brothers in Christ Jesus. The only true cohesive power in the world is Christ. He alone can bind human hearts together in genuine love. Until this genuine love and trust and comradeship is evident among peoples of all races and nationalities, there can never be permanent world peace. Lastly, there must be freedom from eviction. The human heart craves a permanent home. To any thoughtful person, the prospect of being evicted at the close of his life is terrifying. This is just what death amounts to for those who do not know Jesus Christ. There is nothing more dreary and forlorn than homelessness. And the unconverted face not only this eviction, but they must go into a place that Jesus warned about and called hell. One moment in hell will convince any person that however many blessings and delights he may have during this life, all were just mockery. Thanks be unto God, thousands listening to my voice have the assurance that they are going to a home where all is happiness, joy, and peace. This blessed hope fortifies us to bear our hardships. We will not insist on our wants here and fight over our rights, but we will be willing to suffer the loss of all things for the sake of those things which are yet to come. Earthly possessions will not vitally concern us. The quality here may be poor, but the Bible teaches that the quality there is far better. The possessions here will pass away. The possessions there are enduring. No one can have real peace who does not have the assurance of a permanent and happy home which will not be subject to earthly casualty. Some time ago, two old friends were dying. The one was rich and the other was poor. The rich man was outside of Christ and he was talking to another of his friends. When I die, said he, I shall have to leave my riches. When he dies, he will go to his riches. And thus in a word he summed up the two radically different principles which governed the world and the Christian. Peace is not arbitrary. It must be based upon definite facts. God has all the facts on his side, the world does not. Therefore, God and not the world can give peace. It is honorable, right, and praiseworthy that our leaders should seek and promote national and world peace, but they must recognize its limitations without Christ, the Prince of Peace. The Bible teaches that man will never come to this place of tranquility and permanent peace until Christ, the Prince of Peace, comes back to this earth. Therefore, the whole true body of Christ is longing and waiting for that day when the clouds will fold as a scroll, the trump of God will be sounded, and the voice of the archangel will be heard. And then the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible teaches that there is coming a glorious day when man shall know war no more, when Jesus Christ comes to reign and rule for years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm in that kingdom. I'm on my way to heaven. I am looking forward to that glorious day when Jesus Christ will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Are you? I entered that kingdom by being born again, by repenting of my sins and receiving Christ as my Savior. I have the peace and assurance that only Christ can give. There's meaning and purpose in living. Do you have it? If not, you can have it right now by making your commitment and your decision to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank Thee for a gospel of hope at this hour of history. We thank Thee that Thou hast promised us freedom if we will put our trust and confidence in Thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we proclaim this gospel, not only on radio today, but throughout these islands in the Pacific, that many hundreds will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and the freedom that he promises. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.